Hey, this is Dr. K from my medical school, and today we're going to talk about COPD. So let's begin by discussing what is COPD. So COPD is a progressive airway obstruction that is associated with inflammatory changes of the lung that also may have some extra pulmonary manifestations. COPD is due to inflammation, apoptosis, otherwise known as cell death, remodeling of the lung architecture and tissues, as well as oxidation. What causes COPD? COPD can be caused by both environmental and genetic risk factors. The number one risk factor for COPD is cigarette smoking. No, there's a dose-response relationship between smoking and COPD, meaning those who smoke more are more inclined to develop COPD, and the severity of COPD also increases as well. There are other risk factors for developing COPD. These include occupation, gold mining, coal mining, and con textile industries are some of the occupations associated with higher incidences of COPD. The reason why is that many of these occupations are associated with higher incidences of smoking. Now, let's take a look at some of the genetic risk factors. The number one genetic risk factor is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency results in decreased alpha-1 antitrypsin production, otherwise known as AAT. AAT naturally inactivates elastase, and elastase in our body breaks down lung tissues. So without this AAT, elastase can work uninhibited. This results in the destruction of the lung tissue. Other manifestations of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency include cirrhosis of the liver. We can diagnose alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency by testing AAT levels. If they are less than 80, then you have a diagnosis of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and should then get a genotype to identify the severity of the deficiency. Note, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency testing should be done for all COPD patients, but especially in patients who are young that have developed signs of COPD. We can further characterize COPD patients as either having emphysema or chronic bronchitis. Emphysema is enlargement of the distal airways with destruction of the tissue without associated fibrosis. Essentially, what happens is a thinning of the distal airway tissue. And you can measure this by looking at the DLCO on pulmonary function tests. Chronic bronchitis is when a patient has cough that is productive of at least two tablespoons of sputum on most days of three consecutive months in two consecutive years without the presence of other lung diseases like bronchiectasis. These are important characterizing features for COPD patients as it can help change management. Now let's look at the symptoms and signs of COPD. COPD patients commonly complain of exercise limitation meaning either in their exercise regimen or within doing their daily activities, they notice they are getting more short of breath. They commonly complain of chronic coughs that may or may not be productive of sputum. They will likely present with dyspnea. A lot of times on physical examination, you can note prolonged exhalation. And then they'll have significant sputum production as well. Some patients will have chest discomfort, but you need to make sure to rule out acute coronary syndromes as a cause. Wheezing would be characteristic of COPD. Hyperresonance to percussion, meaning there's a lot of air trapping. So on exhalation, since there's significant amount of air still present, their lungs are hyperresonant on percussion. Decreased breath sounds, again, secondary to air trapping. And then finally, the use of accessory muscles which indicates shortness of breath. Now that we know the symptoms and signs of COPD, let's look at how to diagnose it. We diagnose COPD using spirometry. We use two values. The first is FEV1, or forced expiratory volume in one second, which means the volume of air that you can exhale 
in one second. The second value we use is called forced vital capacity, meaning if you take a full breath in, it is the volume of air that you will exhale if you make a complete full exhalation. Using the force vital capacity and FEV1, we can figure out if someone has COPD. So, to diagnose any airflow obstruction or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease such as COPD, we look at the FEV1 over FVC ratio. If this is less than 0.7 or 70 percent, then the patient has an airflow obstruction. We can further characterize the severity of the airflow obstruction by solely looking at FEV1 or forced expiratory volume in one second. The lower the value, the worse the COPD is. It is important to differentiate COPD from other pulmonary abnormalities such as asthma and restrictive ventilatory defects. Asthma responds to a methylcholine challenge. While COPD may have some mild response, it is not as profound as a response as an asthma. Restrictive ventilatory defects like obesity and pulmonary fibrosis produce a low FEV1 and low FVC. But because they're both the numerator and denominator are both low, they produce a normal or supernormal FEV1 over FVC ratio. You can think of ventilatory defects as a balloon that has a rigid wall. If you try to blow air into this balloon, the balloon will not blow up to its maximal size. This rigid wall represents either pulmonary fibrosis or pressure placed on the lungs by obesity. So when a patient with restrictive lung defect tries to breathe in, they can't breathe to their optimal volume. Next, we need to look at the contraindications to doing spirometry. Spirometry should not be done if there's any acute disorder that you think will affect test performance. But it should not especially be done in patients who are vomiting, have nausea, have vertigo, hemoptysis of unknown cause, who have a pneumothorax, recent abdominal or thoracic surgery, recent eye surgery, uh, recent history of MI, and also if they have thoracic aneurysms. Now let's talk about the stages of COPD. The stages of COPD are important because they will help dictate treatment. So the stages of COPD were determined by the Global Initiative for COPD. They are based on post bronchodilator FEV1 levels in the setting of a reduced FEV1 over FVC ratio on spirometry. Let's begin with what the stages are. Stage 1 is called mild COPD. It is characterized by an FEV1 greater than 80% of predicted. Stage 2 is moderate COPD. It is an FEV1 from 50 to 80% of predicted. Stage 3 is severe COPD, and it is characterized by an FEV1 from 30 to 50% of predicted. Stage 4 is very severe COPD. It is characterized by an FEV1 below 30% of predicted. Now that we've discussed the stages of COPD, let's look at the treatment of COPD. The number one and most important treatment for COPD is smoking cessation. Getting your patients to quit smoking is the most important therapy for COPD patients. Many times patients will try to bargain with you that they will decrease their smoking as opposed to quitting. A study was done that compared complete versus incomplete smoking cessation. In those who completely stopped smoking, the decline in their FEV1 was significantly reduced over time. However, for those patients who did not completely stop but just reduced their level of smoking, there was no decrease in their COPD risk or in their disease progression. So the maintenance of even a small amount of smoking still placed them at significant risk for COPD and for those who already had COPD, 
did not improve the progression of COPD. Now let's look at some active interventions for the treatment of COPD. The long-term care for COPD is the use of bronchodilators. Bronchodilators improve your FEV1 or severity of COPD. They provide symptomatic relief by reducing the hyperinflation that's characteristic of COPD. There are two classes of bronchodilators, anticholinergics and beta agonists. The way we prescribe treatment is based on a stepwise fashion correlating with the severity of COPD in any given patient. Now let's look at the short-acting anticholinergics. The most common use anticholinergic that's short-acting is ipratropium, but make sure to use this with caution in patients with narrow angle glaucoma or prostate hypertrophy as it does have side effects in those patients. In addition, long-acting anticholinergics include teotropium with very similar side effects. Because of the anticholinergic properties, they may worsen these conditions. Next, we'll take a look at what beta-2 agonists we have available to use in COPD patients. Let's look at the short-acting. So there's albuterol, levalbuterol, biotolterol, and pyrobuterol as our short-acting beta-2 agonists. In addition, we also have available to us long-acting beta-2 agonists. And these are salmeterol and formoterol. Now that we have gone over the different medications that are available to us, let's look at how to use them. So we use treatment of COPD in a stepwise approach. So first look at for patients with mild disease. So number one, you always want to reduce risk factors. You should start a short-acting bronchodilator, specifically ipratropium, and then provide them with a rescue inhaler in case they get acutely short of breath. Then they can use inhalers such as albuterol, a short-acting beta-2 agonist. You should make sure patients should have influenza vaccinations and also consider pneumococcal vaccination as well. For moderate patients, you know, always add a long-acting bronchodilator. And then for severe patients, think about an, adding an inhaled corticosteroid if repeated exacerbations keep on occurring. For those who have very severe COPD, it's really important to add oxygen because oxygen decreases morbidity and mortality in patients with COPD. And for those who have been almost refractory to therapy, consider actual surgery. And we'll discuss that a little bit later. Now, let's look at an important study that was done on COPD patients. This study was called the TORCH study. The TORCH study evaluated whether a combination therapy of fluticasone, with salmeterol resulted in reduced exacerbation in patients with moderate to severe COPD. Essentially, they did a double-blind placebo-controlled trial with about 6,000 patients with moderate to severe COPD. They had multiple arms. One was a placebo group, one just had fluticasone, one group just had salmeterol, and the final fourth group had both the combination medication. The conclusion of this TOR study was extremely important. Now, all treatment arms, both fluticasone alone, salmeterol alone, and the combo alone, show decrease in exacerbation events. But specifically, the combination arm provide the greatest reduction in exacerbations compared to any other treatment arm. And this was a statistically significant reduction. One drug that you may hear of a lot when talking about COPD is theophylline. It is a very old drug and now no longer commonly used. Currently, you would only consider the use of theophylline in patients with severe COPD who are still symptomatic despite receiving maximal therapy. The reason theophylline works, it has both anti-inflammatory and bronchodilator effects. We need to monitor serum levels as it can have toxic effects of supraventricular tachycardia. Oxygen is another important therapy because it is one of the few medications that reduces mortality and morbidity. There are specific guidelines that will allow your patients to qualify for oxygen. These conditions include a partial arterial oxygen level of less than 55 percent, 
or a partial oxygen level of less than 59% if they have peripheral edema, a hematocrit greater than 55%, or pulmonary hypertension. No, oxygen can increase CO2 retention, but maintaining an oxygen saturation just above 90% minimizes the risk of worsening hypercarbia or CO2 retention. Another option for therapy is pulmonary rehabilitation. Pulmonary rehabilitation includes physical training programs that increase the exercise capacity of COPD patients. Remember that pulmonary rehab does not change spirometry values. It only provides symptomatic relief and helps reduce the medical burden of COPD patients. Now, the next treatment that one can consider is surgical treatment. A trial was done called the National Emphysema Treatment Trial, otherwise known as NET. In this trial, moderate to severe COPD patients were randomized to medical versus surgical treatment arms. The surgery performed was a lung volume reduction and lung resection. All patients were given pulmonary rehabilitation. The conclusions were actually very interesting for the study. So prior studies have shown lung transplantation COPD patients did not increase survival as compared to medical therapy, but may have improved quality of life. In lung reduction surgery, there was noted increased mortality in patients with an FEV1 less than 20%, a homogeneous distribution of, of emphysema, meaning emphysema in all lobes, and a DLCO less than 20% of predicted. The reason for these is that these three groups of patients have very severe COPD, making it difficult for them to even survive the surgery. A reduced mortality was noted with an improvement in functional capacity in patients with only upper lobe emphysema and low exercise capacity. They measured exercise capacity by the number of watts they could reduce in exercise testing. So for women less than 25 watts and men less than 40 watts. Now let's briefly talk about COPD exacerbations. A COPD exacerbation is when a patient with COPD develops shortness of breath and cough with a purulent sputum in the acute setting. Common symptoms and signs include wheezing, fever, fatigue, tachypnea, cyanosis, and mental status changes. The most common trigger for COPD exacerbations include respiratory infections. This involves both viral and bacterial infections. The criteria for hospitalization for COPD exacerbations include mental status changes, increasing shortness of breath, worsening hypoxemia, hypercarbia, inadequate response to intensified outpatient treatment, other comorbid diseases, and the availability of caregivers to take care of the patient and coordinate care. The treatment of COPD exacerbations requires multiple arms of medications. The first is antibiotics. Generally, we use a quinolone or a beta-lactam lactamase combination. I usually use moxifloxacin for at least three days. Systemic corticosteroids, such as prednisone, which you can use 40 milligrams for 10 days. And then an acute exacerbations provide both a short-acting anticholinergic and a beta-2 agonist. Consider nebulized treatments in patients who are extremely short of breath, and especially in those with altered consciousness. You may want to get an ABG to think about intubation as well. So we covered a lot in this video from diagnosis and treatment of COPD to COPD exacerbation. If you like this video, give it a like. If you have any comments or suggestions for future videos, place a comment down below. And if you like the series of videos that I do, Try to subscribe to iMedical School. Also, just to let you know, you can download these videos from iTunes. Just search MedPulse. And check out MedPulse.org for other articles and videos as well. This is Dr. K from iMedical School, and I'll see you next time.